Canning, fermenting, which is more nutritious? What's better to do? That's the question I'm answering on today's Ask Wardy. Welcome. This question comes from Simply Put Mama on Instagram. She says, Hi Wardy, I would love if you could address canning versus fermenting on an episode of Ask Wardy. I see the probiotic benefits of fermenting, but depending on the food, I would like to have canned or plain flavor over a fermented flavor. Is there a way to can without losing the rich nutrient content of fresh produce, legumes, etc.? Thank you. Simply put, Mama, thank you for your question. Because we're answering it on an episode of Ask Wardy, you get a free gift from us, and that's a free ebook and video package, so we will be in touch to give that to you. The links, transcript, and more are ready for you at askwardy.tv. Look for episode 147 if you'd like to go further with anything that I cover today. Okay, so we're gonna talk about preservation methods today, contrasting canning with fermenting, specifically nutrition and flavor. So because we're contrasting these two, I just have to throw in freezing and dehydrating as well to make this a complete resource. So we're gonna talk about what's best, canning, freezing, dehydrating, or fermenting. To discuss all those, there's a lot of variabilities and there's no really right answer. You have to discuss a couple things with each one to get to the bottom of what's right for you. And I'm gonna talk about the nutrition of each. I'm gonna talk about the storage method of each, and then if there's any extra considerations to keep in mind. And so then by the end, you might have a sense of what might work for you in certain situations. That's my goal anyway. So we will begin with canning. So in canning, the nutrition. No way around it, but when you can, you're using high heat and or high pressure, so there is nutrition loss. That's pretty simple. What about storage? Storage is actually pretty simple with canning as well. You do need space for all your canned goods, but it can be at room temperature, so you need a pantry, cupboards, shelves. I know people just keep it in odd little corners throughout their house. You just need places for all these jars. Extra considerations. The nutrient loss that I pointed out isn't necessarily an issue if it's a food that you're going to be eating cooked anyway. So like tomato sauce, beans, meat, and that's one reason why I have canned these in the past and I probably will continue to do so, because we eat them cooked anyway, so why not have some put up that are ready to go and can't. Another consideration would be high heat. So it's not only the high heat the food undergoes, but if you're in a home in the high heat of summer and you're constantly producing for hours at a time this high heat on the stove with boiling water and pressure canners, then that can be unbearable. So it might be something where you do it outside or hopefully you have air conditioning. Also, I believe that canning takes more time and expertise than other food preservation methods. And regarding the expertise, I don't particularly know a lot about canning, so I don't consider myself an expert. And so if you do want to learn about canning, there's two resources I recommend. One is Melissa Norris. She's an online colleague and friend. Actually, we've met in real life. She's a sweetheart. She has a home canning with confidence course. If you go to tradcookschool.com slash canning class, where canning class is all one word, you can check that out. Also, another friend online is Sharon from Simply Canning, and she has a book of the same name, Simply Canning, which you can get at tradcookschool.com school.com slash simply canning. She also has other online resources for canning as well. Final consideration with canning is you are dealing with glass jars, so they're heavy, so not that portable. Like if you were gonna go on the road, canning's a little bit cumbersome simply because of the glass jars. Freezing. The nutrition of freezing is pretty simple. Nutrition generally stays the same. However, over time, as foods have been in the freezer longer, they do tend to have a nutrient loss. Storage. So in order to freeze, yes, you need freezer space. So if this is going to be a huge preservation method for you or your family, then probably your fridge that's in your kitchen, the freezer is not enough space, so you need additional freezer or freezers in order to put more and more produce away in the freezer. And this is especially when you're talking about freezing whole vegetables or fruits, as many people do. They put whole eggplants and whole tomatoes and whole bell peppers in the freezer. They just freeze their garden abundance that way. Well, that takes a lot of space. Extra considerations. To avoid that freezer burn that is inevitable, you can double or triple bag what you're freezing and do make sure to squeeze and or remove as much air as possible from inside those bags and that will push out the freezer burn longer. You can freeze in glass jars. However, glass jars have a tendency to break in the freezer. There are special glass jars that are completely straight 
and this makes them less susceptible to breaking because actually the weak point on a jar when freezing is the shoulder right here where it curves. So if you're using regular canning jars for freezing, make sure your food stays below the level of this shoulder and or use straight freezer jars. And a final consideration with freezing is that some foods don't freeze well because they actually chemically change due to that freezing process. Having said that, I think there are some foods that are ideal for freezing and that would be fruit such as berries, butter, cheese, and just foods that you can easily have batches and stick in the freezer for later. Dehydrating or drying foods as a preservation method. So in terms of nutrition, dehydrating like freezing is a preservation method where the nutrition is essentially the same. It's preserved. However, with dehydrating, you'll have nutrient loss over time. In addition to, it really hinges on proper storage methods. So let's talk about storage now for dehydrated foods. There's a lot of variability with dehydrated foods. Some dehydrated foods will keep for 10, 15 years or more like grains or beans if stored properly. Others have a much shorter shelf life. But generally speaking, when you're dehydrating foods, if you keep them dark, if you keep them cool, and also with regard to temperature is few temperature fluctuations. So it should be cool and steady. It should be dry, so not moist, but dry. In addition, it should be free of critters because you know bugs will eat down your storage. So it has to have all those things to have ideal storage conditions to, so that your foods will last as long as possible for their type when dried. When you're storing dehydrated foods, you need you know, look into containers and there's lots of different things, but you possibly be looking into buckets, desiccants, which are those little packets that you put inside your dried food containers. They even come in like supplements and they draw excess moisture so that the food itself doesn't decay from the moisture. You might need to look into vacuum sealers to remove excess air and to vacuum seal foods for long periods of time. So there's a lot of different equipment that can go into this to make them as preserved as well as possible for the long term. Shelves, obviously, so you need a place to store your buckets or your vacuum sealed packets or your jars with food and desiccants. The dried foods all need to go somewhere. Now it is true that with dehydrating that because you're drying out the food you are removing the water content and food is tons of water. So the food actually when dried will take up a lot less space and be a lot less heavy so that's a great benefit but you still need space for it. Extra considerations with dehydrating. So meat, this is a big one. Unless the meat is very low fat and heavily salted, it actually can't be stored for long periods of time. I think that dehydrating is ideal for grains, beans, herbs and spices. Even some fruits like fruit leather is great dehydrated. Also, when you're thinking about dehydrating foods, Something to keep in mind is that sometimes you dehydrate things with the intention to rehydrate them later. And that can work fantastic, like when you're dehydrating um, already cooked rice and it becomes instant rice and then you rehydrate it and it's fantastic. But some foods don't actually revert to a great texture and so your family might not like them when they're hydrated again. And one more final consideration, which maybe should have been the very first one, in order to dry foods, you need a dehydrator. Now some people can dehydrate foods in ovens and or warm locations in their house and whatnot, but most of us are gonna need a dehydrator, which is an investment, and I do recommend the Excalibur 9-Tray Cube Dehydrator because it's very flexible, maximum usage of space, great temperature range and whatnot, and you'll find a link at the show notes, askwardy.tv, look for episode 147. All right, fermenting, let's talk about fermenting, and I have here your classic ferment, sauerkraut. In terms of nutrition, fermenting is arguably the best food preservation method because not only does it keep the nutrition of the fresh fruit or vegetable or whatever you're fermenting, but the nutrition is increased. You have an explosion of probiotics, enzymes, vitamins, and beneficial acids that are really good for your gut in addition to the acids or what help to preserve the food. Storage, you need extra cool storage, whether it's an extra refrigerator or a root cellar that maintains a constant cool temperature, but there is no way around needing cool storage for ferments because room temperature is not gonna work. It just doesn't. Extra considerations with fermenting. The very first one, it was brought up by you, simply put mama in your question, that you would prefer to put up your vegetables with a mild flavor rather than a fermented flavor. And this is a big one. So a lot of people don't want all their produce 
or maybe even they don't want any of it preserved through fermenting because they just don't care for the taste. Now, I do believe that we can get around that and that it's an acquired taste and it probably could be overcome, but still, it's a real thing that if you don't want to have sour pickles or sour sauerkraut for all your produce, then fermenting may not be the way to go. Also, although fermenting is arguably one of the easiest preservation methods, hot summer temps can be challenging with fermenting as well because if the temps are over 80 degrees Fahrenheit, then some of your ferments just may not go smoothly. There is some trial and error in learning fermenting, even though it's easy. Be sure to visit the show notes because I have links to our own ebook package and e-course on fermenting. So, simply put mama and everyone else, let's just talk about the bottom line here now that we've compared and contrasted the four preservation methods, looking at their nutrition, their storage needs, and also extra considerations. I think the bottom line here is really gonna come down to storage for one, because for some of the methods you need extra fridge, extra freezer, and so just if you don't have the space or the appliance for that, that's gonna rule out some of your options. Doesn't mean you can't do a little bit, but in terms of a major preservation strategy for your family, you might be limited in your storage options. So definitely consider that carefully, what is practical for you to implement in your space. I also think that tastes are huge. So if your family does not like the fermented or sour flavor of fermenting, even if it's the most nutritious, even if you have the space, it would be a waste if nobody's gonna eat it, right? So in which case, do some of that, but focus on other preservation methods where your family's actually going to eat the food that you preserve. Because bottom line is that home preserved food is better than store-bought in many things, nutrition, taste, freshness, cost, so you really have to pick what works for you. So simply put mama, unfortunately I can't give you a way to increase the nutrition of canning. I do think that canning removes nutrition in most foods. However, it may not be an issue if it's a food you're gonna eat cooked anyway. But I hope you found this helpful to evaluate whether or not fermenting, at least some fermenting, could take part in your family's food preservation strategy. Remember, you can also visit the show notes for links and more to all the different resources I've mentioned today. It's askwardy.tv, episode 147. Thanks for joining me, everyone. I hope you have a happy Easter, and I hope to see you again next week, same time, same place, for another episode of Ask 40. Bye-bye. God bless you.